All right, grab your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 1. I want to share with you some things that have been on my heart um, <clears throat> concerning the youth, teens, young adults, um, some things that have been going on in my head for the last couple of months, but they really kind of crystallized in my mind um, when we were at camp and got to hear a lot of things and uh, see a lot of things, and God really uh, spoke to me. Um, concerning them. I was talking to someone and I told them that I think it is rare to see someone who is young serve the Lord. It is very rare to see someone who's young serve the Lord. Now, some of you might say, well, I see kids in the church all the time and they seem to have a love for God. And what I think what you're seeing is the difference between um, a respect for God and a relationship. There's a difference between you respecting God and having a relationship with him. Most kids, just whatever you tell them, that's what they believe. If you tell them something, then they believe it because they're very trusting. They don't have any reason to believe that you're not going to tell them the truth. My little cousin Shay, whenever I would babysit him, if he wasn't eating his food, the way I would get him to eat his food is I would tell him, there's a monster in the garage who will eat you if you don't eat your vegetables. And he would say, there's a monster? And I would say, yeah. He said, then I'll eat. He, he was so trusting of me that there's no way he thought I was actually lying. He believed me. Now, if I try to try that on a teenager... Like, if you don't do your homework, there's a monster in the garage that will eat you. They would not go for that. Why? Because they have matured. And we all, even though we start off very, very trusting, as we grow, we start to see the world a lot different. I've never met a four-year-old atheist. I've taught children's church for a long time. I never had a four-year-old go, this whole thing about a supreme being in the sky who created all things, that's just absurd to me. I've never met that kid. In fact, I, whatever I tell them, they believe it. Why? Because they are trusting. They have no reason to believe that you're not telling them the truth. But we all know you grow, you mature. There was a point in your life, fellas, where you thought girls were yucky <laughs> and ewy and they had cooties. But at some point in your life, I don't know when it was, you, you were like, hmm. <laughs> okay. Now, as for me, I, I don't remember a time where I ever um, didn't think girls were beautiful. <laughs> I, I cannot remember a time, even in preschool. It's like, hey. <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> Play with the blocks, okay. <laughs> And then do your ABCs? Okay. You should come over here and swing with me. I only weigh 45 pounds. Come on, we can both fit on here. Young age. Love. So I, I don't remember that. I don't remember. Um, but at some point, you mature. And girls aren't yucky anymore. Um, and at some point, kids grow up. And what I see in youth and kids and teenagers is they don't have a love for God. They don't search after him. They have a respect for him. They enjoy the idea of church. Why? Because their parents told them, you should go to church, you should believe in God. And most people say, if you believe in God, they say, yes, I believe in God. Um, it's so rare that we had to come up with a word to describe someone or a, a child. You know, we say they're on fire for God. What, is it, what does that even mean? When you say somebody's on fire for God, what you're saying is they read their Bible. They pray. They worship. They serve God. They give of their money. That's not being on fire. That's called being saved. <laughs> but what is supposed to be normal is so abnormal that when we see it, we say, oh, that person is on fire or that person is radical. Why is that radical? Why is it radical to bring your Bible to church? 
We, we, we think bringing your Bible to church is radical, is being on fire. We think people lifting their hands to God who has saved them is radical. That's not radical. That's normal. Now, the Bible does talk about growing in our faith, and the Bible does talk about maturing in our faith. Peter tells us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He tells us in 2 Peter to add to our faith love and faith and uh, perseverance. There's, there's, a, there's a maturing process. There's a point where you're a baby in Christ and then you become mature in Christ. That's true. You should see people maturing. But to say that somebody who is a Christian who reads their Bible or who goes to church regularly is now on fire or radical shows that it's so rare. Now you might say it's rare among adults, probably, but I think it's even more rare among kids and teens. You just don't see that. When I was growing up, people thought I was just like some weird person. Why? Because I, I loved Jesus, and I was 10. Like, you're supposed to be loving other things. What are you doing in the church service? That's weird. And nowadays, when we come into the church and we see somebody who is young serving God, that's so rare that we say, wow, God is really working. And and that just bothers me. It bothers me that it's not normal in our church to be sending out young men and women who are growing and maturing in their faith and who are affecting the world outside for Christ. Because most of the kids that we produce, most of the kids that we know and love are not saved. And that bothers me. And today is Youth Sunday. And it's supposed to be youth-led. And we're supposed to be packed out with youth and kids and teens. And you don't see it. A lot of the people that I grew up with in Sunday school and cell group and we went to camps together, they're not here. Most of them. There are a select few that are still here. So what, what, what does the Bible have to say? My heart was drawn to, Je- to Daniel chapter 1. So if you're there, Daniel chapter 1. Thank you, sir. If you got it, say, I got it. Okay. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure of the house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the, uh, to the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Amazing story. Here's a trivia question. How old do you think Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, and the other guy, I forgot his name. How, how old do you think they were? They were 14 or 15. Now, when you think about Daniel, you always think about him in the lion's den with a you know, gray beard and you know, old dude. These are not old people. They are young teenagers. And they've been taken from their home, brought into Babylon to learn the literature and the theology and, and everything that that culture had to say. And, and they were young. They were not old. Now, I want to make three observations about this story. And I want to apply it to those of us who are young, teenagers, kids. And there's a, it, everything will apply to everyone. The adults will get something, too, because I have a specific word for the adults at the end. But everything will apply to everyone. But specifically, I want you to notice, number one, these young men were in a pagan culture. They learned about that culture, yet they never compromised. They were in a pagan culture. They learned about that culture, yet they never compromised. One of the mistakes I think Christian parents make is they isolate their kids. And they put them away from all the ideas and philosophies of the world. Why? Because they don't want them to become polluted. They don't want them to be affected by what the world has to say. And here you see these four young guys, they are in pagan culture. They are, they're learning what um, Babylonians believe in their theology and their gods and all their literature and all their poets are learning all of that, but they still are remaining true to Yahweh. So they were able to learn these things and it not affect their faith. If you constantly um, separate your kids from the culture that they live in, you're going to make them weak. They're not going to be able to deal with the issues that come up. And I don't, when I was growing up, no matter what my mom told me not to do, I always wanted to do it. And usually I tried to find a way to do it. So she would not know. Don't listen to secular music. Hi, mom. I won't listen to secular music when you're there. <laughs> you know what I did? I got myself a little AM, FM radio. And when I would go to sleep at night, I would put it in my ears and turn to 106. <laughs> and I would listen to the song. Because I was always like the one kid, everybody singing the song. I'm sitting there like, doo -doo -doo. I don't know any of the songs. <laughs> everybody just singing all these songs. Tennille, one of them, just, just going on, just singing. I said, I want, I want to be able to sing with them. So I would put this stuff in there, and I would listen to it, and I would come back like, yeah, I know that song too. Oh. Wanted to be like, you know, everybody else. But I found a way to get around it. Now, I'm not telling you as parents to not set boundaries for your kids and tell them not to listen to things, because I'm glad my mom told me that, because I probably would have been a lot worse if I was able to just freely listen to all that. But what I'm saying to you is that just by isolating your kids from things, they are still going to find themselves in that position. They're still going to hear that stuff. What, what goes on at schools today is a lot worse than even when I was there. 
I mean, some of the stuff kids are saying now, I'm like, wow. They hear that. But if you don't give them a way, how do I deal with that? Do they understand what evolution is? Because all they've heard is, Jesus created the world, period. If anybody tells you anything else, they're wrong. And so somebody says, well, what about the evidence here, 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 here? And they go, well, I don't know, but Jesus created everything. It's evolution. <laughs> Evil. And they have no way of answering the question. They have no way of arguing because we haven't taught kids how to think. They don't know how to think. When I went to the JC, I, I signed up for a class. I forgot what the name of the class was. In the very first day of class, the teacher got up and he started talking about um, how Genesis 1 and 2, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, contradicted each other. That chapter 1 was different than chapter 2, so they contradicted each other, therefore the Bible is no good. So I sat there and I went, <laughs> All I know is, it is true, but I, I, I didn't know how to respond. So I went home to my dad. Dad, this guy in my class, he said that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 are contradictory. I'm dropping the class. <laughs> my dad said, you cannot drop the class. <laughs> you, and he's, I'll never forget, he said, you are going to have teachers for the rest of your life, rest of your in school, that are going to say things that you don't agree with. Even in seminary, you'll have teachers who will teach you things that are not right. Doesn't mean you drop the class. It just means you need to learn how to respond to those things. Learn what their position is. Learn it almost better than them so that when they give you their position, you're able to say, okay, I understand what you're saying, and I'll, now I can respond to you. Kids don't know how to do that now. Kids don't know how to think anymore. It's now all just tell them what to believe, and they don't know how to work through an argument. And these four young guys, they were learning culture. They were learning theology, and they were learning about stuff that they did not believe. Allow your kids to get into things that aren't necessarily biblical. Why? Because it will help them to be able to reach the world around them. If they can understand what um, the world believes, they'll better be able to minister to them. This guy named Jay Budashevsky wrote a book called How to Stay Christian in College. And the reason he wrote it was because he found that 70% of Christian teens who leave from their churches and go to a university end up walking away from their faith. That is a huge number. That's most of the people. Why? Because they get to college and the college professor tells them there is no God. There is no God. You know, I can prove it to you. Here's a piece of chalk. I'm going to drop the piece of chalk. If God does not stop this piece of chalk from falling and breaking on the ground, then he does not exist. One, two, three. Let's go. Chalk falls on the ground and breaks. God does not exist. Class dismissed. And the kids go, hmm. <sighs> Don't know how to respond. I know you probably know how to respond. God's not a circus animal. <laughs> if I tell you, give me a million dollars right now or you don't exist. <laughs> God is God. You're not going to have some puny human telling them, stop this chalk. But, but kids don't know how to, how to respond to that. Why? Because they've never heard that. That's why one of the things I teach the kids in, in children's church, this is what people will say about Jesus. This is what people will say about the Bible so that, oh, really? People actually believe that? How do I deal with that? So here's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're in a pagan culture, and yet they're learning the culture. And so true success, true success can be achieved without spiritual compromise. See, this is what the world tells you, or even some people in the church. In order to succeed in the world, you need to compromise. So if you want to be an actor, you need to kind of do the things that they want you to do, even though it, it goes against your conscience. And I really believe that God will honor the Christian actor who says, they're just a line I will not cross. And he will make him or her famous. Why? Because they honored him. People in politics who would just say, you know what, I will stand for truth no matter what the culture says. You can stand for God, 
You can stand for truth, be successful, and not compromise. But the world tells you the, the way to go is through compromise. If you just compromise and just kind of you know, give, give them what they want, and, and yeah, you might feel bad, but you know, at least you'll be getting what you really want. In the end, God says, really, true success is pleasing me. If you're pleasing me, you're truly successful. And they took on the names. You know, they took on these pagan names. And they didn't cause a fuss. They learned these things. They didn't cause a fuss. But they still had a line. So number two, in pagan culture, they refused to disobey the word of God. In pagan culture, they refused to disobey the word of God. Now, most people follow the crowd. Most people follow the crowd. Some people are leaders, but most people, if everybody else is doing it, they usually do it. Whatever is the newest craze, everybody's doing it. I don't know if you guys have heard this thing called planking. Everybody gets on some sort of thing, and they lay straight, and they plank on it. So there's all these pictures everywhere. So everybody now is planking. If you have, just, just Google it. Now there's a new thing called owling, where you sit like an owl on stuff. So there's people on bars, people on slides, owling. And everybody's doing it. Now you're all like, that's, that's stupid. But you follow the crowd too. If I were to take some of the pictures of some of y'all from the 70s. Some of y'all hair. Platforms. Bell bottoms. That's just my, that's planking in the 70s. <laughs> you follow the crowd too. But God has called us, even in a culture that's doing things, he says, I want you to be different. And there's a certain line. Now, listen, I'm not telling you that certain dances and certain slang and certain um, style of clothes is wrong. I, I think that's part of who we are. God created culture. So that's why you wear the clothes that you wear. That's why you like the certain style that you like. That's God given. But there, there are some things that the world does that goes directly against what the word of God says. And so you can't, you can't go that far. So can you wear a hat? Absolutely. But when the Bible says there are certain things you need to avoid, you need to avoid those things. And these four guys, they decided we're going to stand for the Lord. How did they do that? Because they, they listened to all their teaching, but they said, we're not going to go as far as to partake in the royal food. Now, what was the problem with that? Two reasons. Number one, the food that was um, being served was probably offered to an idol. So if you eat food that's offered to an idol, you are almost indirectly worshiping that deity. And they had many deities. So they might you know, we don't want to participate in that. The other thing is that the food that they were eating was probably unclean that there were certain foods Jews were asked not to eat. So things like pork and things like horse flesh, all those kinds of things they were asked not to eat. And they, um, the, the Jews were not to have any blood in it either. And so they probably had blood all in it. And so all these things are happening. He said, um, Daniel said, I will not defile myself. We're not going to defile ourselves. This is where we draw the line. And you notice he disagreed with those who, who were in authority, but he still had respect and tactfulness. I think Christians should learn that. Because people, when, when, when we're standing for truth, we can be very rude. When you ask people about the, the homosexual community, and you talk to certain Christians, they're, they're just super rude. I'm standing for truth. And you guys are stupid. And I've, I've heard, sometimes I get embarrassed. And you wonder why sometimes people think Christians are jerks. Because a lot of them are. Daniel goes to him and says, please, can I just, can I, can I talk to you for a second? We, we don't want to get you in trouble. But we can't, we can't eat this food. We got we to gotta figure something out. So what do you say? For 10 days, test us. We'll eat just vegetables and water. And then at the end of those 10 days, we'll see who looks better. Because the idea was, if they're eating all this food and we're just eating vegetables and water, then they're clearly going to come out looking better. But we're going to show you that our God is with us. So watch. Now, the word for vegetable there means um, that which is sown with seed. 
So it was probably not just vegetables, but fruit and grains and bread made from grain. So it wasn't just vegetables. But the point still Daniel's trying to make is that God was with them. Um, praise God for meat. Because some of you read the story and say, see, this is God's plan for diet. <laughs> no meat. And I'll say, I said Jesus. That's not what it says. They, and first of all, they only ate it for 10 days. And in Genesis chapter 9, God allows us to eat meat. Now, is it probably a little bit more healthy in some senses? Yeah. But at the end of those 10 days, who looked better? These four young men. Now, something that's also interesting, Daniel and his three friends were not the only ones taken into captivity. There were other Jews. But what seems to be indicated is that all the rest of them just started eating. Which is interesting because oftentimes, even in Christian community, you need to stand out. Sometimes all the people who are Christians are just kind of going along with what's going on. So even in church, you can be like, yeah, he's, he's really into this. <laughs> Like, he comes with his Bible, his pen, and his pad, and he's, like, really, really into this. And Daniel and his three friends, they they said, we're not going to go that far. We're going to honor God. We're going to honor his word. There's a difference between living before God and living before men. Let me ask you a question. Why do you obey? Or when you were growing up, why did you obey? Now, when I, went to, when I went to school in Sacramento, I was like, I'm free. I can now do whatever I want because mom and dad are no longer around. And they can't tell me what they, they want. They're not going to be there. And they're not going to find out. But I, I got very suspicious that there might have been spies or things around because I would always look around and say, man, what's that dude looking? What's he doing? Scared their mom sent someone say, make sure he's, he's acting right. <laughs> but let me tell you, I had many opportunities to be crazy, and I didn't. Not because mom would find out. Not because dad would find out. Not even because she might have had spies or she might have bugged something. <laughs> but because I wanted to honor God. Amen. Because we live before an audience of one. If you, if you live to please people, you will become a hypocrite. Because you'll come to church and you'll be all churchy. And then you get around non-church people and you'll be just like them. These four guys, they decided we're not going to change with the surroundings. I call it chameleon Christianity. You know what that is? Wherever you are, that's what you become like. And they were in that culture and they learned certain things, but they, there was a certain um, line that they would not cross. Um, So Daniel and his three friends, they stand for truth. They know that the word of God calls them not to partake in food that will defile them. And they stand for truth. Number three. In a pagan culture, they were blessed. In a pagan culture, they were blessed. God gave them favor when they obeyed. God blesses us when we obey him. That's a beautiful truth to me. Obey God and he will bless you. He will give you wonderful and great things. James chapter 1 verse 17. You know it well. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows if you disobey you will have hardships when people often have issues or problems and they come to talk to me one of the questions I ask them is what area of your life are you disobeying the Lord in what area of your life are you disobeying the Lord 
If there's an area of your life where you're disobeying God, it's possible that he is disciplining you because of your own folly and sin. If you just do what he says, God's commands are not put there to hurt you. It's like the kid who's like, please let me put my fingers in this socket. It looks so inviting. And you say, no. No, you cannot do that. You're not trying to be mean. You're trying to save them. And God, he gives us all these commands. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to save us. But we think God is being mean. If you disobey God, there are consequences. And let me say to to some of you, because this was me, that God has been calling you to walk away from your sin for such a long time. And he has been holding back the floodwaters of his wrath and asking you to escape, to evacuate. And at some point, he's going to remove his hand, and you'll be swept away. God is so patient. He says, please, get out. Please, move. Please, get away. Because at some point, I move my hand and you will be swept away. In a moment, life can be done. I don't know if you guys know who Amy Winehouse is. Singer, 27, overdose, gone. Do you think she woke up that morning thinking, I'm going to die? There are consequences to your sin. And God, he's so patient with you. But please hear me. At some point, he is going to remove his hand. And when he does, God have mercy. Trust me, I'm speaking to you as one who has been warned by God numerous times. And he has been gracious enough to allow me to escape. And if you're hearing what I'm saying today, please do not ignore it. Because these four young guys said, we're going to obey God. And when they obeyed God, he blessed them tremendously. If you look at verses 9 and 7, it's very clear that God was the one who was responsible for their success. In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So it says that they became, they were 10 times better. In in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, they were 10 times better than any of the other people they had. Why? Because God gave them that favor. God blessed them because you stood up for me. Now remember, they're in exile. They could have become bitter and said, man, he let us get into exile. We're not going to live for him. They could have been bitter, but they said, no, we're going to stand for truth. We're going to stand for what we know is right. And God blessed them. So we see these four young guys, they're in pagan culture, learning the culture, but they don't compromise. We see them refusing, even in pagan culture, to not disobey the word of God. And then we see the result that God blessed them. And I would say to those of you who are young, who are teenagers, let that be your life. You learn culture. That you don't disobey the word of God and that you see God's blessing in your life. Now, to you parents and adults. Um, four things I want to say. Um, and these things have been going on in my head for, for months, and I, I, I'm sometimes scared to say them because I want, I'm hoping, oh, it'll get better. This will change. But hopefully you'll hear my heart um, when I say these things. So four things to parents. Number one, um, give grace and resist the temptation to be a skeptic. Let me explain what I mean. The church is good at preaching grace, but horrible at practicing it. We can preach grace like no other, but we are horrible at practicing it. We, we like to see people punished. We like to see people get what they deserve. 
We like that. We enjoy that, unless it's us. If it's us, oh, Lord, please have grace. Please have mercy. You ever see somebody speeding? And pray, oh, Lord, get them. May a policeman just be around the corner. But when you speed, you don't pray that. Oh, Lord, let me get caught. You, you just do it. And when, they, when you see him get caught, you go, yes, yes. <laughs> Justice. <laughs> see? <laughs> but when you, when you get stopped by that policeman, don't you, want, don't you say, officer, <laughs> please, <laughs> have, have grace, have mercy. <laughs> um, we like to see people get punished. Remember the, the lady, Kate, is Casey Anthony, is that her name? And, and all that, that was a crazy case. And I wasn't even following it that closely until the verdict came, and then all these people just, like, blew up. But did you notice the reaction? Because people said, she should be punished. She has done what was wrong. But I wonder, I wonder how many of those people, if they stood before God, would say the same thing about themselves. I deserve to be punished, too. We are in need of grace. And the reason I say this is because our kids, our teenagers, our young adults need grace. Because they're going to mess up. They're going to do dumb stuff. And what they don't need is for us to be skeptics. Meaning, we look at them and say, he's not going to change. She's not going to change. She's going to be the same. Some people act like the devil. You know how the devil acts? He's always accusing. Always. He's always saying, you're, you're no good. You're, you're not good. God, God doesn't love you. How could God love him when you've done all that? And sometimes I hear what people say to the kids, like, you've done that. You've done. You messed up. You've, you're, you're so. And I'm thinking, goodness gracious, that's just like the devil. Am I telling you not to correct your kids? Absolutely not. Correct them. But you should never correct anyone without giving them the gospel. What you say to them, yes, you have sinned. Yes, you have messed up. You should repent. But I want to remind you that Jesus on the cross has paid for that thing that you did. Give them the gospel. He died. He was buried. He rose so that you could have eternal life. This sin that you've committed is not the end. So you correct them. When you correct your kids, give them the gospel. May they understand, yes, I've done what was wrong. I sinned against God. I sinned against Daddy. I sinned against Mommy. But Jesus, if I ask him, will forgive me. That's how you correct. You don't want your kids to be off in the corner, beat up because all you did was correct them and beat them with the stick of correction. Cover their wounds with the balm of the gospel and let them feel the love of God and his grace and his mercy. We often are just so harsh with our kids. Give grace. We, we forget how much we need grace. I heard at the camp, this guy, he said that, I'll never forget, he said, we need just as much grace as Osama bin Laden needed on the day he died. Because often you think of Osama, you say, oh, that dude, he really needed grace. But you need it just as much. There's, there's something that sneaks in in our heart. It's this pride that sneaks in, that thinks we deserve the grace of God. You don't walk around saying, I deserve the grace of God. You don't, believe, you don't say that, but it sneaks in in your attitudes and the way that you give grace and mercy to other people. It sneaks in because you think God, somehow he looked and he saw all the great things that I am, and he said, oh, man, of course. Of course I'll give him grace. Of course I'll give him mercy. I like one guy said, our self-perception is as accurate as a carnival mirror. <laughs> you think you know what you look like? You know oh, you think you really are? No. <laughs> so we fight sin. There is a real battle. Kids fight with sin. Save kids fight with sin. There is an enemy within them. This other guy wrote this. I love this. He said, how often do you think about the fact that we carry around in us a deadly companion? That sin that is within us is a deadly companion. And we have to constantly fight against it. This came to me very, very clearly this last year. One of my favorite Christian rappers two years ago um, had an affair. And he was a pioneer in the Christian hip-hop, 
had started, planted a church in Philadelphia, and the church was growing, God was blessing, and then at some point he had an affair. Now, the affair was an emotional one. It was a non-physical affair. Um, he admits there were physical exchanges, but everybody around the situation said it was not sexual. But he admits it was sin, it was wrong, it was adultery. He removed himself from leadership. He resigned. Uh, he left that church. He went into hibernation, into his house. His wife was mad. Kids destroyed. Every, all ministry just gone. And I was devastated because he was like my idol in the non-bad sense of it. Just loved him. Just loved him. And I was crushed. And then later on, another one of my great heroes, preachers, same thing. And I'm just like, God, what is going on? So fast forward to today. The Lord worked it so that um, he showed him that um, I have grace for those who need it. And um, his new album is called Stop the Funeral. Because really, in his mind, he was really headed to his funeral. He was just going to stop doing ministry, just kind of fade to black and get out. And he said, the Lord stops and no, you're still usable. In fact, you're going to be the very thing that messed you up is going to be the very thing that you proclaim from stages. That God has grace on those who need it. But what's interesting about him is that the people that were his best friends, people that he was in ministry with, the people that he thought would welcome him back didn't. The church, the church at large, most, a lot of the church said, he's an adulterer. He's a cheater. I can't listen to his music. I can't, I can't follow him. And here's, here's the problem. I don't have an issue with the fact that you are a little weird and say, okay, I want to see what this guy has. But what I'm bothered by is the lack of grace. That the same sin that he committed, you commit all the time. And the church, I mean, at large, people just say, I won't buy the album. I won't support him. He's been so, he was on the 700 Club this last week. And they did this whole story. And it just, to see his wife on TV saying, I forgive him. The Lord has forgiven him. Our family's put back together. But many of the church is saying, no, he doesn't deserve it. He's an adulterer. Now, what if God, every time you talked, brought up your past stuff? That's a terrible I that's a terrible thought. Every time you talk, God says, Oh, but you did that. Remember that? Yeah. So with our kids, don't be a skeptic. Believe that God can change them. And when they mess up, give them grace. Say, God gives you grace. I want to give you grace. I'm going to correct you. <laughs> I'm going to give you the gospel. But they can detect that you really believe that God can do something in their life. A kid knows when you're just telling them stuff. So, number two. Number two, encourage them. This is, this is huge for me because my whole life has been just a series of different people encouraging me in what I did. There are people in this church who are just encouragers to teenagers and the young kids. One person in particular, um, Miss Joan. She is such an encouragement to me and to many of the other young kids in our church. She doesn't just, she'll stop you and say, I want to tell you something. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, just listen, just listen. I don't, I don't want to take your time too much, but just, 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 just come close. Let me, let me tell you something. And she will, and she gives me all these great things to show to the kids. She'll give me a you know, newspaper clipping and say, here, show this to the kids. And, and she gives you cards with money in it. <laughs> and many of you in this room can say, I have gotten a card from Miss Joan, and she has given me money. And you know what you guys have said? She's such an encouraging 
person. She just says things to me that are encouraging. Many people, many of you, when I was growing up and I was young and I was doing things, you encouraged me. Baby, that was a good sermon. You preached it. <laughs> Great sermon. And they give me butterscotch candy with it like half open. <laughs> like, oh, no, I can't eat this. <laughs> Even this morning, Miss Lois came up and, and just encouraged me. Just and, it, and it gave me a confidence that is even right now helping me to preach this message. They need encouragement. They need encouragement. When you see them up here as kids and they um, say a scripture, go to them and say, that was a great job. Kendall, Caleb, Azariah, Nia, Nia. <laughs> the great job you dance so beautiful here's some candy here's some money people on your birth you know how wonderful it is just to get something on your birthday many of you have given stuff to me on my birthday you don't have to give stuff to me on my birthday you don't have to give stuff to other people on their birthday that is encouraging and kids what will happen is they'll say people are behind me they believe in me because if they don't get it here they'll go out there to get it because people out there will compliment them that's why girls go out to get a guy out in the world because they'll tell them about how, the way that they're looking at it because they don't get it here. They don't, guys, Christian men don't say, you look nice this morning. You are a wonderful woman of God, so they got to go out there to get it. Encourage them when they're young so that they know you're behind me. You believe in me. Number three, be an example to them. Heard somebody tell me, that they tell their kid, don't do as I do, but do as I say. Um, we are built to absorb what we're around. Yeah. So if you're around certain things, it's just going to be how you are. Um, my dad, whenever he touches something, he uses his middle finger. So it's not, he's not flipping people off. It's just the way that... <laughs> I guess in Africa, he just points. So if he's, you know, on the, uh, the microwave, he wants to change the thing. He'll use his middle finger, and he'll do, 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 do. And me, my brother, says, we always made fun of him. Dad's flipping off the microwave. <laughs> and we would just be laughing, laughing, laughing. And it wasn't too long ago. I was in the car, changed the radio, and I was like this. Chate said, oh! <laughs> it was crazy. She did it too. We all, did, we all, whatever we're around, we just absorb. I'm like my dad in different ways. I'm not like him in many ways, but I'm like him. In many, I'm like my mom in many ways. Why? Because I grew up around them. And your kids, I don't care what you tell them, they're going to absorb who you are. Most of the time, your kids turn out just like you. So don't tell him, I don't know why he liked that. I told him. <laughs> I can tell you why. <laughs> I can tell you. They need to see examples. They don't, what kids don't need to see are um, fake, phony Christians. They don't need to see that. I would rather somebody just not come to church. Just don't come. <laughs> Because what they see is, oh, just look what she's doing in church. She's worshiping the Lord. Oh, okay. Outside. Oh, look what she's doing outside of church. I can do that. And they learn that. I remember when I was growing up, I had teachers that I would spend the night at their house, and I would go home and say, Mom, oh, my goodness. I didn't know. I didn't know that people acted so differently outside of the church. I didn't know that. I thought if you were in church, you acted like a Christian everywhere. But, again, we wonder why our kids are the way they are. They learned it from us. And by God's grace, they can unlearn it. But we've got to start young. Last thing, we're done. The last thing, and I think the most important thing, you have to pray for them. It's the most important thing. I'm a Christian today. Because my mom and dad prayed for me. 
I'm saved today because they prayed for me. God did not save me because I'm good looking. <laughs> That's not why he did it. The reason I'm saved today, I have to break that up because my goodness. <coughs> the reason I'm saved today is because my mom and dad prayed for me. My grandpa prayed for me. I, it, I was knocked off my rocker. My grandpa told me I was two or three. I don't know how old I was. He said um, I was crawling up under something. And he said the Lord spoke to him and said, that boy is going to preach. And he said from that day he started praying for me. It blew me away. Um, I don't, I don't understand parents who do not plead with God that God would save your kids. They don't come into this world loving Jesus the way he needs to be loved. They're dead in their sins. And if God does not awaken them, they will be lost parents if you don't pray god save my son he is not going to be saved because he's at church i'm not a christian because i grew up in a in a pastor's home if you think that you're absolutely wrong eli was a priest and he had wicked sons samuel was a priest a prophet and he had wicked sons Aaron was a priest and he had two sons that God killed because they offered strange unauthorized fire to the Lord thinking that they can just approach God any way that they want it to. God wants to save your kids, but the Bible says you have not because you ask not. Maybe your kids aren't saved because you don't pray for them. And when I say when I say saved, I mean like really saved. <laughs> Not they come up here and they do something one Sunday, but I mean they're really pursuing God. There's a difference between loving God and treasuring God and savoring God and the, the kind of Christianity that we see today and the religion that we see today. If Pray for your kids. Pray that this church would launch out men and women, young men and women who are saved, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who just stand out. If we don't pray, they will not be saved. If you have kids today and they're young, pray, God, change their little heart. Open it up that they might come to believe you and know who you are. If we do that and we do it with fervency and we pack out this church on corporate prayer nights and other prayer nights, I believe God will do it because he wants to do it. He doesn't want to see anyone perish, but everyone come to repentance. Let's pray.